Paula? I'm sorry? You know, one of the nice things about being grounded intellectually, and by that I mean being able to kind of observe your environment and see what the requirements are. For example, sometimes students come to class and ask me, do you think money is important? Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, but it's also quite stupid. Put that to test. Don't pay your landlord. You know, and when the end of the month comes and your landlord says, where is my rent? Just ask him, do you think money is important? <laughs> and, and see how far that will take you. You know, your question has been asked by so many people through so many different generations and cultures. The truth is, when you look at society, there isn't much out there that you can like. Let's just say Oakland. Drugs, homelessness, poverty, it's dirty, it's smelly. Public schools in Oakland are quite bad. Private schools are quite expensive. And if you pay attention to your own life, to your own body, to the way that just social forces impact you on an emotional, physical, intellectual you know, levels, you say to yourself, do I really want my own children? to become like this? And the answer is, of course, no. You know. But what options do you have? And that's what I mean by being grounded. The truth is, if I had tons of money or was sitting on a mountain of money, I would have never sent my kids to school. It's good to be socialized, but it's also important to kind of custom make what socialization is, how it's made up, and what sort of components it has. As a mother, you have a good amount of fear inside you. I mean, no mom or no father, no parent desires to see their kids in the streets, be on drugs, alcohol. You know, you're very careful who they hang out with. In fact, you're very careful who you hang out with when they're around. You know, so the question, should kids go to school? If you live in the woods, no. If on the other hand you live in the city, yes. There's a great story that was given to us. I think it's the first, in fact, story that was ever written. It's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, it comes from the Sumerian culture some about 5,000, 6,000 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's an epic. And there's a difference between an epic and, say, a story. An epic, if I was to kind of sit with you and, and just ask you some questions, you're going to tell me stories about your life. And stories about your life doesn't mean that they are universal. It means that they are just specific to you. An epic, on the other hand, it has components that every person shares. Okay. There is arrogance that comes with power, forgetfulness that comes with power. It's something we talked about on Tuesday. There is also meeting a stranger. And you're trying to figure out what to do with this person and you wrestle intellectually until there is, the dust has settled. You accept the fact that you can't live without this person. It's called love. And this person impacts you 
in such a way that it's not forgettable and it just transforms you completely. And then there is the theme of loss. You love someone and you lose them and you can't replace them. And so you go on this long journey. Why? Because you've come to realize that in the presence of death, almost everything about your life becomes meaningless. And you go on this quest. Could there be other things in life that are worth pursuing besides going to the lane, pursuing money, being married, having children? Is there, for example, using Christian terminology, is there like a kingdom of God within me? So what you have in that story are two human beings. One is Gilgamesh, who is the product of society. And he's corrupt. He's forgetful, he's mean. In many ways, he's poisonous to himself and other people. He insults and offends the gods on a daily basis. To tame him, to educate him. Hello. The gods send down another human being. His name is Inkadu. Now the names themselves are quite significant in meaning. Gilgamesh means, I'm gonna put this very crudely in a language that all of us can kind of grasp. Someone who lives in society and feels its burden, is discontent, unhappy, miserable, is always looking for a way to come to life. That is who Gilgamesh is. And the only way he can come to life is by kind of encountering a man by the name of Inkadu, means a man who is born innocent and remains innocent and lives an uncorrupted life and does not live in society, lives in nature, lives in the wild. His education comes by kind of like Henry David Thoreau going to Walden, you know. You don't need to go to a club or a bar to see people get drunk or dance. Just go out there, watch the wind as it flows through the trees and the leaves can dance for you. You know, the water is beautiful music. The movies can be animals walking back and forth. You don't live in wilderness, Polo. You are the product of society. You are contaminated in so many different ways. And most of the emotions you have, most of the images you have in your mind are the product of society. Let me give you an example. The Inuits, and these are Eskimos, certain tribes. And sometimes, kind of like the people who live in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia you have sandstorm. For the Inuits you have snowstorms. Now here is what both of these groups of people do when they encounter a storm as such. When the snow falls really, really heavily to the point that it's just blinding, you sit on the snow for hours until the storm dies. You don't get frustrated, you don't get angry, you don't curse at existence, you just sit very patiently. Now imagine someone who wants to come to school at say nine o'clock in the morning, leaves the house at 8.30, and they're coming from Hayward to Oakland. They're going to find what? Traffic. Now, they're not going to be very patient getting stuck in traffic, why? Well, first, you have a thousand TV channels. You can change through the channels every nanosecond. You have messages you send through text, a couple of seconds. You don't even have to step outside to get your food. You call, they deliver. Everything about our life is fast paced. You get into traffic. Now, you expect the traffic to be or going to Laney as fast as sending your text. But here's the thing. Your culture has not trained you to be patient. Why? Because everything in your disposal takes place very, very quickly. And all of a sudden you get frustrated. Now, you can only do so much with your frustration before it turns into anger. And then you have road rage. And then God knows what the heck you're going to do. And then you're going to walk to class. 
Now remember you walk to class as a volcano ready to erupt. And I'm going to say, are you sweaty? Are you smelling too? And I'm just being sarcastic, trying to break the ice. But you're a volcano and it only needs so little for you to erupt, and that's me. Now, you begin to come forth and wrestle with me, fight with me, argue with me. And you also live in a culture that's unreflected, which means that you're not going to be mindful. You're not going to say, okay, I'm going to walk the classroom angry, and I shouldn't be that. It's against my culture. It's against human decency. No. You have <coughs> every right to be angry because that's what the culture gives you, a sense of entitlement. Now, when I ask you a question, that's called invasion of privacy. I'm here to teach you a couple of facts, and you say, teach your class and let me alone, or leave me alone. And that's the approach. And all of a sudden, you realize the emotions you have inside you are made by society. You have so little power over your life and how you want to make your life, create your life, or you, what you want to do with your life. What are you going to do with your kids in Oakland? What, you're going to take them out of school? And then what? Are you rich? Are you creative? Do you and your husband have a lot of time on your hand where you can just go to park or the zoo or go to the woods, walk around, go to museums, educate them in arts? No. You're like the rest of us in bondage. <clears throat> and what happens when you're in bondage? Well, you have to be obedient. You know, it's kind of like uh, if you've seen Matrix 1, <coughs> where Morpheus tells Neo that human beings are no longer born, that they are grown. To be born, it's a difficult act. You know, you have to kind of figure out how you want to be born, in what shape, in what form, what components do you need to have to be born in that particular way. Then you have to go shopping. Then you have to bring home the ingredients and apply them, cook them, apply them. So ultimately you can be what you want. You don't have that privilege. So your question, should kids be educated in this particular setting? What other choice do you have? Just in case you don't send your kids to school, you're going to get a call from the county. And they're going to ask you, on the record, we see that you have two kids, eight and four. They are school ready, and yet there is no record of any of them going to school. What's going on? Even if you decide not to send them, the city won't leave you alone. And let's say you don't even get a call from the, the county. Is, are you really going to risk the physical and emotional health of your children because you have this fantasy or fantastic idea that education in this particular way that America does it, it's unhealthy for my children's psyche. There was a guy named Rudolf Steiner. You know, uh, he didn't enjoy society the way it's been created. He was one of those guys, he was like a Jesus Christ of sorts. Not to that degree, not that potent or intense. But, you know, he was a guy who thought about things. And he gave birth to a kind of educational environment that he called Waldorf. You know, and there are still places in America and other, you know, uh, countries that practice that particular setting. There is one in Grass Valley. It's above Auburn. It's the only, I think, school in the country that is free. Doesn't charge you a penny. Now, you kind of send your kids there, and the teachers, from kindergarten to 12, they have one single teacher. Now imagine when you spend that much time with a single human being. They become your second parent, or maybe the first. Because you're there to give your kids food, shelter, and clothing. You can't contaminate your kids with your fears, with your ridiculous fantasies about who you are, what you are, what the meaning of life is. That task is left to educators who are seasoned, 
not only seizing in the practicality of life, but also thinking, examining. And so they kind of have a piano there, have a garden there, have a mathematics books there, have like, I don't know, painting there. And they kind of just sit back and watch. Where is this kid going? And they come to realize every morning from 8 to 12, they just keep looking at the piano. And they say, well, it seems like that's the pull. That is what the core of this kid is. He enjoys music. And so music becomes primary. Survival in society becomes a secondary, which means that they kind of uh, feed the spirit as well as the flesh. Now, the problem with Waldorf School is that eventually, as a kid, you're going to you know, come to this place. Once you're done with high school, you're going to come to society. The problem is that you're going to be a weirdo. You have no social mannerisms. As far as education goes, uh, for children, let me also preface all of this by saying, talking about this stuff is so easy. So, uh, never fall into this trap of just because someone is giving you all these profound and flowery words or ideas that you should follow them or follow their advice or their philosophy of life. Never do that. You know, if someone keeps talking about, you know, cooking, tell them, can I come to your house for dinner tonight? And then taste their food and see if they can actually cook. You know, maybe their brain is just an encyclopedia, but then, you know, they just don't know how to cook well. <clears throat> there are a couple of things I think it's important to know about life. It doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter what you do, you're always going to be disappointed. Always. There is no place you can go where disappointment is not waiting for you. I'll give you an example, and I'm going to use Jesus Christ because this is the West, and most of you are familiar, hopefully, with the literature that is in the Gospels. Because they are really great books. And you don't have to be religious. You just have to be curious. Okay. Now look, you have a kid, you know, and at the age of 12, he's always been a little weird, a little unhappy, a little miserable. You know. So at the age of 12, his parents take him to the synagogue somewhere. And he kind of just walks away. And Mary is worried, Joseph is worried, and they go look for him, and eventually they find him preaching to these elders. Say, we were worried sick about you. What's wrong with you? Well, didn't you know I'm going to be at my father's house? I'm your father, Joseph says. No, you ain't my father, man. God is. You know? And imagine how a father would feel. Okay? So, then at a certain point he says, you know what? I, I don't think Nazareth is my home. I don't really care for my mom. I don't care for my dad. I don't care for this religion called Judaism. I don't care for the Jews or the Pharisees. I don't care for any of these people. I want to figure things out for myself. Talk about being authentic. For 18 years, he disappears. You know, you would think that when your mom, Mary, tells you, son, listen, you are not the product of human sexual act. God laid with me. And you are mostly divine and partly human. You would think that would, that would make you happy. He's not happy. He comes back at the age of 30, 18 years. Does he go to his mom? No. Does he care that his dad is dead? No. He just goes to the synagogue. What does he say? 
You guys have been waiting for a Messiah. Here I am. And he would think that people would embrace him. But no, they kick him out. Talk about being disappointed. You know, going to the desert for 18 years, becoming wise, being touched by God, or in fact, being God himself. Coming back, you know, assuming that people are going to receive you well. No, he gets rejected. Another disappointment. And then three years of work. Supposedly he dies at the age of 33. Three years of work. First, people like him. Then they hate him. He has 12 crummy disciples who near the end all betray him. Then he is crucified like a criminal. And what does he say on the cross? And remember now, at the moment of death, you would think that this is a man of God or God himself. He feels so alone, so much in doubt. I mean, forget the Garden of Gethsemane where he says, let this God pass by me. He loses his faith. He's consumed by doubt. And in the end, he says, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Now, the point I'm trying to make is that this is Jesus Christ. And I can give you other people throughout history who have been equally disappointed, if not more. And disappointment is painful. You know why you're disappointed? Because you have expectations. Now, none of you in this class should go turn on the TV, go to YouTube, and type in the search engine, Eckhart Tolle, where he talks about detachment. Don't do that. It's poison. It's untrue. If you're a human being, you're here for one reason, all of you 20 people in this room. You look forward to your future. That means you have expectations. You're not just coming, sitting in this class in hopes of getting an F, but an A or a B or a C, a passing grade. And you know what happens when you get an F? It goes against your expectation. And do you know what happens when your expectations are not met? You become sad. And remember, we are poor. If you happen to have billions of dollars in your account, you can spend it freely and expect nothing because there is more you have in the background. For you and I, we have 10 bucks. If we go to In-N-Out, if you're waiting for these hot french fries to come our way, they come back stale. Now, you don't have extra cash. You're going to be pissed. Yeah? Um. So that's the first thing, Paula. It matters very little where you go and how you go to the place you want to go. Disappointment awaits you. Another name for disappointment when it becomes a little pregnant or layered is suffering. The only thing you want to do for your child or for your children is to make sure that in life, they have no choice but to suffer. They just need to suffer not as much. Don't create more misery for them by saying, kids, I've come to realize public education in Oakland sucks. Sorry, I don't have money to send you to Head Royce or day park, or park day, or whatever. You know, you just go to the park and learn from the crickets there. But what are you gonna do when they turn to be 15 or 16 or 17? God forbid, if something happens to you, something happens to your uh, companion, what happens when they're orphaned? Who's gonna take care of them? How are they gonna survive? In and out, Home Depot? They're going to live paycheck to paycheck for the rest of their life. And you know what happens when 
you're suffering a bit too much. Well, when you suffer, what happens when you have a toothache? You want to go somewhere and get it, pull it out. If you can't have the money to get someone to pull it out, what do you do? You do drugs. Now, what happens when you put someone in a difficult condition in life? They can only, you know, cope with it for so long until it starts with alcohol, maybe perhaps porn, maybe perhaps fighting, going out there and just getting themselves in trouble from poverty. Now remember, I'm not saying poverty creates addiction. I'm saying poverty in certain places on this planet, such as America, it does create addiction. Mexico is poor. Most of the places in the Middle East is poor. Many places in Africa is poor. India is poor. I'm not saying there are no addictions there, but not on such a massive level as America has it. There was a fight for those of you who enjoy boxing, and I suppose the violence a little bit. In 1978, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Muhammad Ali was a little older. George Foreman was in his prime, I guess. And people had mentioned that George Foreman is just going to knock out Muhammad Ali. It won't be that difficult. Round eight comes, Muhammad Ali knocks out George Foreman. And then people celebrate, you know, his victory. You know, I don't know if, if you guys know who he is, but I can tell you that when I was in Iran, whenever we would hear that Muhammad Ali is going to fight, we would wake up at like three or four in the morning, sit by the radio, and just listen as to how the fight is unfolding. It was beautiful. Now, as Muhammad Ali is walking through the streets in Zaire, okay, there are all these people who don't have houses, who don't really have food, <clears throat> who don't have clothing as much. They're cheering him, celebrating his victory. And Muhammad Ali at some point looks at them and says, I have no idea how you guys do it. We have poverty in America. You guys are poor, but you have something that Americans don't have. Dignity, decency, self-respect. If I was to give you again a real answer to your question, it would be yes. Education is really, really good for your kids. It'll damage them, no doubt, in some ways. It'll clip their wings. You know, you have children. They jump on the sofas. They do crazy things. I mean, they create a good amount of headache. You know, they make you miserable by all the things that they do, never leaving you alone. There comes a point like around five or six or seven where you've sent them to school, you've spanked them enough, you've given them a good amount of do's and don'ts, reprimands and all that. You realize they're no longer running, they're no longer walking, they're just sitting on the sofa playing video games or doing math work and you say, damn. You know, with my own hands I clipped their wings. I domesticated them. The problem with domesticating children is that you know, when you domesticate a cow, for example, you use their milk. You use them as pets. They're actually quite enjoyable animals. But when you domesticate your children, they are exploited by a system that cares so very little for them. I think Matrix, the first one, is quite right. Your kids, my kids, every single one of you in this classroom, you're used as a Duracell battery. All of you need jobs. And what do you do when you have a job? Well, you're selling your time, i.e. life. Eight, nine hours a day for what? 20 bucks an hour. That's how much you're worth. You know. There was a French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote this really quite wonderful book called 
Emil. Uh, it's just about how kids should be educated. He had mentioned that if you want to know who the first criminals are in a child's life, it's always the parents, always. Not because they want to. There is one thing you can do for those of us in this class who have children or who eventually want to have children. <coughs> You know, you have two wings. Clip one of them. Let them be corrupted by society and all of its obligations. Save the other one for the arts. Something creative. So they can balance themselves, each other out. If you can't save money, send them to private school. Yeah, don't public. I mean, nothing against public education in Oakland or other places, but you know, in as much as I think the district here at Peralta, as well as all the administrators, are really doing their best to make Laney work, to function really well, to beautify the physical uh, face of the campus. The truth is. Laney lives right in the middle of Oakland. And look around you. You know, you have homelessness, you have poverty, you have mental health, you have all the stuff. And they're all, all going to come to Laney. It doesn't matter what you do. You fix the bathroom, just wait for a couple of days. It'll go back to being destroyed. You fix the classroom, it'll go back to being destroyed. And it's not because people don't like Laney. It's because Oakland at large just has so little respect for its citizens because it belongs to the larger environment. Consumerism, capitalism, individualism, meritocracy. You put all those things together, what do you have? You have a mess on you. In 2007, I left Laney and I went to a place called Folsom Lake College. Brand new college, beautiful. You could throw your food on the bathroom floor, sit and eat your food off of the floor. Beautiful campus, beautiful students. It's Folsom, they're rich. If they see a homeless person on the streets, the cops are gonna take them, throw them in downtown Sacramento. You know, it's like kicking out the homeless from San Francisco, pushing them into Oakland, and that's how it is. Your um, ultimate salvation is just to leave Oakland, period. 